My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people make friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job, not just to entertain, but educate, teach, put in context. Call me 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me at Jim Kramer. Now that we're on the cusp of earnings season, we need to prepare ourselves. This is a time of tremendous opportunity, but it's also a time of constant mistakes that can cost you fortunes. The house of pain. If you don't know what to watch out for. So rather than obsessing over today's action, was positive. Dow gaining 186 points, S&P advancing 0.70%, NASDAQ climbing 1.01%. A session that again showed a nice contrast to last year's bear market. I want to get you ready for earnings, which could change everything that's happened since the year began. Above all, let's just put it out there. This is the most chaotic time of the year. Companies don't coordinate when they decide to report, so the whole process is nuts. Take Friday morning. We got a bunch of bad. Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America. It's like all these companies are trying to, I don't know, how about give me a heart attack? There's simply no time to make considered judgments in this moment. Instead, we get foolish comparisons based on a few metrics and nothing more. But the truth is far more complicated. Sure, we want to know if these banks are seeing delinquency spike. We want to know if there's loan growth. We want to know how much they're making off your deposits. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Some banks are moving aggressively into digital. Bank of America's got the best major digital bank operation in the world. Others are trying to become asset gatherers to take on less risk, like Morgan Stanley. Fortunately, they report next week. J.P. Morgan wants to offer all, offer all things to all people, from investment banking to trading to wealth management to consumer banking. So others like Wells Fargo are trying to deal with the sins of the past, how much leeway the regulators have. They might, but what can they do in the present? It's very confusing. There's just no way you can compare these banks with any specificity. It's kind of like comparing zebras with gazelles or giraffes with hippos. It makes no sense. Yet we do it because they report at the same time and are therefore pitted against each other. So first rule of earnings season, do not succumb to instant analysis. No need for it. Investing's honestly not that time sensitive as long as you don't put a gun to your head. Second rule of earnings, the first move, it's often the wrong move. When I got in this business, companies would release their earnings. You dutifully match it to the consensus of what the analysts were looking for. You do it, do it all by hand, putting more weight on the analysts with better track records. Then you could judge whether it was really better or worse than expected. Ah, oh, all that's out the window. These days, we have so many services providing consensus estimates for sales and earnings. If the companies report any line item that's weaker than those uh, aggregate estimates, then their stocks... Well, they just go down. Sell, sell, sell. Forecast cuts are disastrous. Because we are still in a quasi-bear market, despite the action of the first few days of the year, forecast boosts may not be enough to move stocks higher. There's a rush among the services to be first, and there's a rush among traders to be first, too. This haste is totally unnecessary. If you're inclined to make instant judgments based on what are often computer-generated headlines, not human, but computer, you should just go to the racetrack or, uh, you know, why not play DraftKings? It'll be more fun, probably more lucrative. These knee-jerk reactions to the headline numbers don't even take into account what's said on the conference call, especially when the CFO gives you the forecast in the middle of the call, the most important moment of the entire exercise. But the conference call is where all the important information is. If you buy or sell before it happens, you're begging to lose money. More on that later. Third rule, please, don't take your cue from the tape. During earnings season, I make most of my decisions without even looking at the stock. I only check it for validation afterwards. I have a set view of, say, how Wells Fargo is going to do on Friday, and then I compare it to the reality of what the stock says it's going to do. This is a complicated situation. So anyone who takes action immediately, you're guessing. But investing is not guessing. If you don't have a view of what you want to hear from a given company, you should forget about taking action during earnings season. I believe in buy, buying and holding with homework or buy and homework. If you haven't done the homework, don't buy the stock. Definitely don't buy it because you heard someone say something good about it on TV, including me. You need to know how you feel about a company yourself before you pull the trigger. You need to know what you're looking for from the results. I can help, but in the end, it's your call. This very morning, squawk on the street. 
David Carl and I talked about how some famous investors feel about the market right now. I demurred. They're entitled to change their minds, and they often do on the spot. So there's not much point speculating. In fact, I started my charitable trust and created the Investing Club to show you how Jeff Marks, my compadre, and I arrive at these decisions. That doesn't make them right, but at least shows you how we got there, because we play with an open hand. You see, everything that we decide, because that's what I wanted, even if it be, of course, pretty embarrassing. How can I teach if you don't see or understand why I'm doing what I'm doing? But everyone else, and I mean everyone else, plays with a closed hand. Because informing the public simply isn't their job description. And it's because of being so darn embarrassing. That's why I'm so focused on revealing the thought process of professional money managers. I want you to know how it really goes on. And what matters here is that earnings season is very treacherous. And I show you that. Don't make it worse by taking action before you've thought through what's really going on. Don't take your cue from the tape or from some talking head. Fourth rule. If you haven't read the conference call, you won't do as well as the person who has. Oftentimes, the question and answer session is the single most important part because you can tell whether the analysts are truly happy with the quarter by their reaction to it. If you get a positive question from an analyst who has a hold on the stock, one that includes a congratulations to the management, you might have a potential upgrade the next morning. You get two or three of these conversions on a conference call, and it could be time to pounce because the stock's about to get some major endorsements. Finally, rule number five, if you're not a professional money manager and you don't have a gun to your head, you don't have to do anything. In fact, the best thing you can do during earnings season is to read the conference call at your leisure until you know everything in it that you need to know. Then you'll know if it's a good opportunity in a stock because the quarter was widely misinterpreted. And that's, by the way, what I think happened to Constellation Brands, STZ, where the stock that cratered last week, okay, it's now working its way back in a pretty methodical, rational fashion, which is why we're sticking with it in the Travel Trust. Remember, this is, this is Corona, Modelo. Uh, these opportunities don't usually come out on the same day, but maybe the day later. I find, by the way, if you're looking for good information, that our interviews on Mad Money with CEOs who've seen their stocks obliterated that same day are often very telling. If they're saying they're going to be big buyers, either with the company's money or their own, you may have a terrific opportunity. And that's what happened right here when Bill Mullins, who's the CEO of Constellation Brands, came on. He made it clear that the company would allocate a lot more money for buybacks, given the huge decline in the stock in that very day, that very day session. So that's what you're looking for. And, of course, you can see, so the stock goes down here on an overreaction. Bill Newlands comes on Mad Money, says that things are actually not nearly as bad as people think, and that December's actually gotten better. And now the stock's working its way back to the point where we had a really terrific piece by Bonnie Herzog, one of my favorite analysts from Goldman Sachs, saying it's been totally misunderstood and it's time to buy. Remember, earnings season is about three weeks a quarter, three, 12 weeks in the whole year, just 12 out of 52, thank heavens. It's the hardest time to make decisions because there are so many decisions to make. That increases the odds that you'll make bad ones. So the bottom line, be careful, be prudent, and no matter what you do, don't be fast. This is a tortoise and the hare situation. So take it slow because you definitely want Aesop on your side. Let's go to Phil in California. Phil. Hello, Jim. I'm a first-time caller and a long-time listener. My question is on Tesla. The valuation suggests an incredible growth of earnings and revenue, and the company is also a voracious user of cash. However, the demand for their cars is slowing down, and they also have a lot of competition as well, with most of these companies selling at around 10 times earnings. What do you think of the valuation of Tesla right now? Okay, well, look, the other cars are, candidly, they have internal combustion engines, but aren't that well, and they have to advertise a lot. I see he's going away. Uh, they have to advertise a lot. And frankly, I, when I look at Tesla, it has come down a great deal. Now, it's not one of my favorites, but let's remember, it is down a lot. Uh, Elon Musk has been distracted by Twitter, but I don't want to count him out. And it does make a lot of money. You said it burns a lot of cash. The important thing is it's, ex it's extremely profitable for a car. Let's go to Jeff in New York, please. Jeff. Hello, Mr. Kramer. This is Jeff from Sotus in Western New York, Buffalo Bills country. Oh, my. It's so great that that young man's come back, isn't it? That's fantastic, it's Hamlin. Perfect. What's going it's on? Serious. The stock I'm calling about is a uh, retail stock that's up 50% since October. 
All three of my kids have asked for their products this Christmas, and all their friends are schooled are wearing it. I also noticed a lot of old guys like me wearing their recently acquired brand. Hey, dude, what do you think of Crocs? Oh, I like Crocs. I wear mine. It's funny. My wife's not crazy about it, but they gave me a pair of Eagles brand Crocs. And I think it's a terrific stock, and it's going to continue. Because even though it's had a remarkable move, it is still very, very inexpensive on earnings. So Crocs is a winner. Be careful. Be prudent. And no matter what you do, don't be fast. Oh, man, buddy, tonight, with the price of natural gas collapsing, what does it do mean for the future of Coterra Energy? which the CBC Investing Club has in the charitable trust. I've got the CEO. Then the action of home builder stocks is certainly flying in the face of logic. What gives? I'm going off the charts to find out. And come on and join Farmer and Jim as we go off the tape to learn more about Back to the Roots, a company working to change the way you and I think about gardening. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.